I'm Ben Klang. I work for a company called Power Home Remodeling. I've been working with telephony and asterisk in particular since uh, 2004, and I've been a big WebRTC evangelist since about 2013, and I love everything communications. Uh, I'm Dan Jenkins. Uh, I run a business called Nimble Ape Limited in the UK. Um, pretty much everything Ben just said, but a couple of years later. Um, my name is Matt Fredrickson, and I work at Digium. I've worked there since about 2001. So I've gotten the opportunity, I've gotten the opportunity and privilege to see Asterisk grow and change quite a bit. And uh, most recently, I was asked to manage the Asterisk project at Digium. And so I get to work with a lot of really smart people that, that work on uh, interesting telephony technologies. And that's been, uh, it's been very exciting for me. Uh, I'm Evan McGee. I work for a company called Ring Plus. We're a mobile phone company here in the US. Been working there since about 2012. We originally built the entire phone company based on Asterisk. And uh, now I'm pretty much focused on um, scaling and providing, uh, basically t taking the telephony side and exposing it to all the other business needs of running an actual mobile phone company. Uh, and so using just a lot of web technologies to do that. Thank you, guys. So with uh, the advent of uh, WebRTC, how do you think that has changed the development path of Asterisk? Has it caused problems? Well, as you may know, Brian, <laughs> WebRTC has been a period of excitement and adventure for, I think, all open source telecommunications projects. And um, what's, what's kind of fun is the last few years before I was working uh, with the Asterisk group directly, um, I had the opportunity to work on some internal services, actually with Dan um, at Digium, uh, that were uh, built around taking advantage of, of some of the new technologies like WebRTC uh, that were in development at the time. And uh, WebRTC, uh, you know, is a suite of technologies that were put together and for the express purposes. So prior to that point, they hadn't really been tested together in the way that they were. And uh, for the last few years, it's been very bumpy working with WebRTC. There's been a number of times um, that the asterisk version of WebRTC uh, for uh, you know, a change in the browser, the way the browsers operate, uh, broke compatibility and things like that. So there's been a lot of very interesting times as, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because asterisk has been around for a long time and most of the protocols that it's, it interops, interoperates with have have been very uh, have gotten to the point where they're very they're very stable, and WebRTC is probably one of the more interesting um, interoperability projects that Asterisk has been involved with, in that it's an it has been an evolving standard that okay. we've had to work with as it's changed, and I'm sure you guys have seen yes, it on the free research side as well, yes. and and it seems like you know every six months or so something will break and right. you have to go fix right. it, and it's not necessarily because you did something wrong, but it's because you know, the browsers decide to update something, whether it be preemptively or in accordance with the spec change or something like that. Right. So that's made it quite interesting in trying to keep up with that. And it's, it's taken a lot of time and effort. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, there's one reason, it's one of the reasons why we haven't really pursued WebRTC much as like a mobile phone company, because it seems like a very obvious thing. Great, we want to have a VoIP dialer, we can use Opus, we can do HD calling, it'd be great. And LTE latencies are low enough where that actually makes sense. But because the consumer ha has to be an, like a very seamless thing for the consumer to be able to log on and do this, and because the spec keeps changing, because things occasionally break, it just doesn't make business sense yet to actually use it in any real world use case that's not very tightly controlled. Um, and so that's what I, you know, I keep following it, I keep playing with it, but I'm just sort of waiting for it to just get really nice and isolated and locked down, uh, just for, even for a good six months. And then we'll, you know, roll out some sort of product on it. Well, um, I, I guess I've got a slightly different viewpoint. So I'm a Google developer expert, so is Ben. Um, it's more specifically around WebRTC. So I, I get to talk to the Google team quite a bit about, about WebRTC, um, things that are coming up, etc. cetera. Um, WebRTC is stable um, for the most part. Um, I, I gave a talk probably like six or seven times last year called WebRTC Reborn. Um, and it's all about how WebRTC had, went through a rebirth. It kind of got born and it was pretty terrible for like three years. Um, things kept breaking, and every single week, like Chrome would release something, and then Firefox would release something that then broke the other side, and an interrupt was terrible. Um, and then, probably like November last year, everything got really good. Like, I think other than one thing earlier on this year, which was an OpenSSL upgrade, 
um, things haven't broken. So none of that actually broke um, browser to browser calling, Chrome and Firefox, um, and even Opera. Um, it broke gateways, mainly. Um, so f from a technology perspective, it's, it's there. Um, yes, there are improvements coming like every single week, but, but Google and Mozilla don't break things every other deployment. Um, so from, from a WebRTC and an asterisk point of view, I know for a period of time there, there was a time where things were breaking a lot and therefore kind of, it was kind of, people had the opinion that, oh, well, well, we'll just wait for things to like simmer down a little bit within, asterisk, within WebRTC to fix it in asterisk. And that's kind of gone now. And so both should be first class citizens when it comes to making things work. So I have a sort of different perspective and it's not even necessarily a technical one. And that is that, um, yes, it's been disruptive. I mean, WebRTC as a technology is, is both similar and very different from previous attempts at linking the world through IP communications. Um, but I think it's also really important. I mean, the last major revolution in uh, real-time communications was taking the wire away from the telephone, making it wireless, making us mobile and portable. Um, but we basically still have the same limitations. We had crappy audio, we had a terrible user interface, and, and no ability to really embed the communications into where people were actually solving problems. So WebRTC is hard because it is a big change, but it's also so necessary. I mean, that there are, there are and will be pains because of that change, but it's, I think it would be, um, it, it's somewhat inevitable. We have, we have to incur these pains and get through to the answer. Obviously, we all want it to be faster, get to the end, but I think it's, it has to happen. All right, thank you, guys. Um, I think everybody up here works with or on WebRTC in one form or another, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So has it, uh, has it drawn in a different type of user or customer base? Have you seen any shifts in that, that relationship? I think the most interesting way to answer that is that people who don't think of themselves as communications companies are applying it. Um, you don't have to think of yourself as a contact center or a long distance carrier. A lot of those metaphors really don't even make sense anymore. Yeah, it's gone, right? So the, the really cool stories we're seeing are, um, you know, distance learning or medicine or, um, you know, in, in communications embedded into workflows. And so telephony isn't even, like, the, that would never even enter the thought process of people like that. Using things like, you know, because WebRTC comes with things like the data channel, right, it just opens up a whole other realm of possibilities that once the actual communications part is solved and embedded in your app, it opens up, you know, people are using that. Suddenly they have access to a bunch of other capabilities that perhaps you didn't think about before um, in terms of uh, business sense. And so the people using it are like, oh, wow, all this cool stuff you can do now. And it's like, yeah, that's just, you know, it's not just for communications in the sense of voice or video. So um, I, I, I guess I, I'll talk a little bit more about WebRTC Reborn, because um, like, this, is, this kind of, again, came up in that. Um, at the very beginning, WebRTC was very much like telephony orientated. It, it, people developing it were telephony people. And so we, we made it too complicated. Um, and so over the past couple of years, things have got easier. And like, web developers actually use WebRTC now. And so it's not a telephony-centric thing that is driving it forward anymore. Um, and so inherently, yeah, you have a completely different kind of, at least developer base, mm -hmm. most and <clears throat> a lot of the time a different user base than, than typical telephony applications. Do you have anything to add, Matt? Well, just, just that um, I think that one of the goals, it seems like one of the goals with adding WebRTC support, so as I recall, um, Chrome, the, the Chrome team at Google, they, they took a look at Chrome and the web, and they tried to figure out what, what things are missing in terms of the web experience. Yeah. Like what things, uh, in terms of what technology, what technology pieces are missing in terms of, of further enabling a more complete web experience, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, that, that was basically the meeting that, that bore, uh, bore out the WebRTC project, the technology project, because historically, the technologies involved <coughs> in real-time communication have been siloed. They're very, very challenging to do. Uh, echo writing, uh, writing a really good echo canceler is, is, is some, some guy in a room's job, and he's an expert at it, and he's got you know five PhDs or whatever in the topic, and, 
and that's what he does, and it, it's a hard problem, and most people can't afford to employ the five people in the world that are good at that, right? Um, and, and that's just one aspect of it, right? There, there's um, dealing with packet loss scenarios, there's dealing with um, trying to uh, deal with uh, higher quality audio and things like that. There are actually a number of things that, that came to the table with WebRTC that kind of enriched the, uh, the telecommunications, what, what you, you consider the traditional telecommunications experience. Um, and so it's, it's interesting to me that what really WebRTC does, if you look at it just from a browser perspective, um, and I like to look at it from two levels, but if you just look at it from a browser perspective, it brought all these very challenging technologies to web developers who don't have to be good at that. They don't have to be intimately, they don't have to intimately understand what you do in packet loss scenarios and how you conceal packet loss, and they don't have to under, understand signal signal processing um, and, and deal well, with Well, they, they still, they still like have that. to understand like SDP, sure. which was like this crazy thing that, that managed to sneak its way in. To, to um, some degree, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, so and you guys there are, are aspects where if you the want to next create question. more powerful WebRTC experiences, you do need to understand some of the technologies under the hood, but you don't have to go and redevelop them, um, which has historically um, caused, I think, some uh, communication silos to occur because companies that have those people employed mm -hmm. and have the expertise in house were the ones that kind of controlled those technologies, like you know Skype, or you know any of the other big holdouts like that. Um, now, now anybody that is a web developer can create a Skype-like Skype-like experience, and they don't have to be an expert in those things. And and I, I take your point, Dan. That sometimes you do have to get down into the weeds of the technology, especially if you're doing anything advanced or anything mm -hmm. that the browsers haven't totally figured out yet. But there are many use cases that we probably wouldn't think of because they're not necessarily sexy, but they actually solve some pretty important business problems. And people who aren't communications experts can still apply the technology. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And without getting to the level of And I mean, I mean, like, if we ignore asterisk here and just say, well, I can go use a platform as a service, such as Twilio or um, Talkbox or whoever, then I don't even have to necessarily care about any of that. I'm using the technology. I'm, I'm, I'm making use of the technology making use of Opus and the benefits there and, and everything else. But I don't need to know about the underlying, the fact that there's SDP and there's offers and everything else. OK. So if you guys were to look out to five, 10 years from now, where do you think this technology is going to go? How far do you think it'll go? Well, uh, you know, I, in terms of I don't know if I want to talk specifically about where the technology is going to go as much as, well, so there's a couple different parts, right? So WebRTC, you can really easily see um, incremental improvements occurring in the protocols and the codecs and things like that are involved. They're already talking about, you know, potential of moving to higher quality, lower bit rate codecs. Mm -hmm. So right now in the WebRTC specifications, you can use either H.264 or VP8 as a, as a way of doing video interoperability. Um, with other browsers and endpoints. Um, they're already talking about moving forward to uh, VP9 or H.265, so the next big codec battle. Um, but so there's, there's a lot of incremental progress that can be made in terms of improving the quality and um, the, the experience of, that these communications protocols provide. Um, aside from that, if you look at the human, the way it's changed the human experience, I think that they've taken something that people have traditionally has been inaccessible to people. So pro the proliferation of video. You know, I think Apple probably did one of the great things, and I'm an Android user, and I, I love Android, but I think one of the great things that, Andro that Apple did was they put a front-facing camera on all their phones. Um, and that kind of, I think, started, in my opinion, the democratization of, of video, right? So that video was accessible and video communications was access accessible to every person, right? That could, that could afford an iPhone, right? But, you know, in all seriousness, um, I, I think WebRC is kind of the next step of that. It, it democratized the, the communication technologies so that you could change how people expect to communicate. And if you'd asked me 10 years ago what I thought about video calling, I was very short, I was very, very um, I was very uninterested in it. I, I had the, I had the, my perspective was that I didn't want people seeing me like, you know, twirl my hair or whatever while I'm on a video call or whatever. Um, it, you know, I thought audio was adequate, but my, my perspective has changed quite a bit uh, since we've started to incorporate 
uh, a number of these technologies in how we interact and communicate, which I think was the goal, uh, one of the goals of the WebRTC initiative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in our meetings at work, uh, we have a daily, um, a daily Scrum meeting. We, we use Scrum Agile methodologies at Digium, and we have a daily meeting where everybody meets together and talks about what they did and what they're doing and what they're going to do. And we, uh, the way that we do that now is we use video for that. And it has completely changed my perspective on, on the utility of having more prolific video. Um, if you look at your children, uh, if, for those of you that have children or look at young people, um, the concerns that I came in with because I was, I was accustomed to the security blanket of audio only communications, they completely don't think about, you know, uh, children will, you know, they'll stay on a, a video call and they'll keep it up all afternoon long and they'll come and they'll go and they'll talk with their friend or whatever, but they're completely comfortable in that environment. So I think it's very much changing expectations of human communication and I look forward to seeing the great ways that it's gonna be used to further um, move that ball forward. So I, I just I want to echo the point about using video for our daily calls. So I, my team is pretty distributed. They're all over the U.S. And, and Brazil and even a couple of the Philippines. And um, audio would not cut it. I mean, a, a telephone quality conference bridge would not a, make for a very cohesive team. So that, that really has changed the way we work. Being able to see the same people face to face every day, you have that more personal connection, almost as if you were in the same room with them. I think as well as being able to share a screen. And absolutely, yeah. And the other point I wanted to make is that, you know, with WebRTC, I think one of the things it really has succeeded where previous attempts at things like video technology have failed. Um, if you look at unified communications, first of all, it never really came to mean anything in particular. And in part, that's because there are so many vendors pushing their idea of it, none of which really interoperate. We can all talk about SIP, but I mean, very few people ex are willing to expose SIP to the internet for a lot of reasons. With WebRTC, because of some of the intentional decisions made, like pushing signaling to the application and not specifying it, what they effectively did was make it so every application can define their own. And as a client, as someone who just wants to use the tool, I don't need anything. All I need to do is go to the site. The site sends me the entire application you know, as a single package. And I'm able to use that tool without any pre-configuration, without any um, you know, too much testing or, or you know, the, the, the parts that made interop difficult. And I think that was pretty critical. Yeah. I can say also from the, just like on the telco side of things, um, that they're not going to change anytime soon. They've spent billions of dollars on like IMS equipment, and that gear is not even fully rolled out yet. They're still converting from TDM links over, um, and based on the four hour conference call I've had over the past two days, it's not happening very quickly, uh, or that smoothly in all cases. So when, an interesting side of this too is that the big carriers are just not going to adopt this quickly. So 10 years from now, they might maybe be installing new gear that perhaps Interoperates now. They do all operate on IMS now. We're moving that way, so everything is moving into the SIP to get stuff sort of in and out. So if you interconnect with them, you might be able to work with them in a much more advanced way. Um, but the actual handsets themselves, I see the WebRTC being built more into. And like you were saying about the kids using stuff, kids also don't mind using individual siloed apps for their yeah. communication, right? I know a girl recently over overheard somebody saying in line in LA that um, Instagram is her brand, but Snapchat is who she really is. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's how they think about it. And I was like, okay, you know, and those are going to use all the same technologies, but the idea of actually federating between them is probably, uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to be until that actually happens. I, th I think that's a pendulum, though, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. And Chris Matthew this morning mentioned the whole app fatigue problem. Um, I was looking earlier, I think I have 15 different messaging apps on my phone, which is a little ridiculous. Yes. And, and I think one thing we are losing um, is the ubiquity of telephone. Everybody in this room can be reached on a phone number, probably more than one, right? But the point is that by exchanging one piece of information, I can reach you. It's, it's a crappy channel, but it's, it's a workable channel. And then, of course, we might upgrade to something like... And, that's, and it's not necessarily just a, a phone call. That's it's, a good point. It, it's an Allo phone call or it's a WhatsApp phone call because yeah. those are based on phone numbers. Whether or not that's entirely right is, is up for debate. But um, that one bit of information can be used for more than just a regular phone call. Good point. But it's interesting because then that, it's effectively a form of identity. Yes. Um, but the identity is divorced from the thing actually using it, which is, which is kind of interesting, right? I mean, fortunately, we have a lot of laws that protect my phone number can't just be taken away from me for the most part. Um, but what happens when, we, when the telephone network is not really sustaining anymore? Like, where, where does that identity go? I think mm -hmm. that's a big problem that we really haven't figured out yet. Yeah, I think it's something they're still working on. I think it's something that we're, you know, we're talking about now that really is not coming up at a high enough level. And they kind of assume the telephone network will always be there with those identity verifications, like the STIR, you know, that kind of stuff. They're really trying to make that really like a cryptographically identifiable 
piece of information about somebody who owns a specific number and there's all the laws and regulations around it. And I think they feel like, well, that's the fallback. We can always just fall back to that. So all the new stuff doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, and I think it'll take a really fundamental shift in that mentality to, to make this interoperation start working and have that pendulum sort of swing back again. So I've got a question from David back here. Hi there, gents. So uh, asterisk in the web, of course, WebRTC is a natural place to, to go because it's uh, uh, an exciting future-looking direction. But of course, asterisk has been working with the web for a very, very long time with uh, AGI and uh, more recently with the ARI. I wonder if you could uh, tell us how you've been using it in, in those realms. Um, I, I take that first then. So um, ARI for me is like a, a natural thing. Uh, I'm a web developer and I came into the Asterisk project as a web developer. I made something for a CRM, a custom CRM system in our business and it just happened to be Asterisk that we tied into. Um, so I, I, I still don't know like SIP inside out and I still don't know like a load of stuff about the in-depths of Asterisk. I don't write C code. That means we succeeded with ARI. <laughs> so, so ARI is like brilliant um, for me. Um, so ARI is, is, is this thing that I can just use and I do HTTP calls to asterisk and, and I get back um, 200s and four, 401s and, and, and it operates in a web way, which is amazing. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's the future of asterisk for me. Um, in terms of building applications outside of Asterisk and using Asterisk as a thing that does media really, really, really well. Um, but I can write my own applications and, and unit test them and, and interrupt with other, other things out there on the web. And, and, and I can write it in Node or I can write it in Ruby. I can write it in Go. I can do whatever I want. So it hands me back a load of control. Sean, Bright, uh, Sean McCord was saying, uh, the other day about how, as developers, we, we love control. Um, and, and it's very, very true. Um, AGI, yeah, is kind of webby, I guess. No, I, I can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. You, you do that. <laughs> ben, please. Um, all right, so my, I, I think that I, first of all, I came from a web background as well. Um, I, I came, when I started working with Asterisk, it was from the perspective of I wanted to build a business we were doing small business services, and we, want, we were doing email and web hosting. We wanted to add telephony to that. And of course, we wanted to tie that all together. And this was way before ARI was, was even a concept. Also, I want to preface everything I'm about, I'm about to say. Um, yes, I was very successful with AGI and AMI. And for what they were in their day, it was terrific. Yep. But the future is clearly ARI. So please don't take anything I say as an endorsement of AGI or AMI. <laughs> Um, but anyway, that being said, you know, a lot of the really cool use cases before WebRTC, before we had the ability to put communications into the application, um, I, I can actually, an, an anecdote from, from work, one of the best features, one of the features we got the most feedback, positive feedback on from our users was also one of the simplest to build, which is click to call. In our application, we already knew the user, we knew what extension they were at within the company. If just by making every phone number on every screen that they saw clickable, and when they clicked that link, it sent an uh, AMI request off to Asterisk to spin up a call to their extension. As soon as they answered the extension, it would bridge out the other side to wh you know, whatever phone number they wanted to reach. That, that one stupid little feature saved them tremendous amounts of time and, and um, not dialing the wrong numbers. And you know, we still get thanks for that years later. So just little things like that, tying those things together. I mean, there are still ways to make telephony a better experience for users by integrating with the web. I mean, I... I can go back to say that, again, I, I just want to echo it yet again, that uh, I'm not endorsing AMI and AGI. Uh, ARI is the future, and it is what Adhesion, the project, basically had to do to, to, they took AGI and AMI and externalized that into the Ruby ecosystem and allowed for endpoint, like HTTP endpoints. So it kind of, it was that wrapper for a long time. And we built our entire phone company uh, using that because we needed to get those web services, everything from billing to everything else we do is all HTTP calls. And there was no real super elegant way to do it from inside sort of um, the dial plan logic. It didn't feel right. So having a framework like Adhesion that could do third party call control in that way uh, was just amazing, and that was, you know, that was what we've used all along. Um, and now with the advent of ARI, I feel like you can actually really, really expand the universe of things that can control Asterix and make it the sort of awesome media engine that it is, and take your business logic and move it out to places where that makes more sense, and you can more rapidly iterate it and easier to deploy it, and you know, it just makes uh, it makes life with Asterix just a lot more fun. I'll just add one thing to that. You mentioned. Um, 
you know, I, I think we get focused on the call, right? We get focused on that. That's the kind of the primary thing, uh, thing we think of with asterisk. But also the fact that the call happened and who you talked to and the recording of it, like all the stuff that goes around it and bringing that back into your CRM or whatever data you have, I mean, that's pretty valuable. We have a screen where you can see every communication we had with a homeowner and it has emails, it has phone calls, it has text messages. All of those can get tied back together. And that's, you know, it's, it's more than just the phone call itself. To, yeah, and to a degree, Asterisk used to be this kind of box, and it did loads of stuff for you. And now we're, we're taking more control out of, out of Asterisk, and, and you're, in, you're in control. You've written the code that does that thing, and then it, you're putting it into a CDR or whatever. You, you might have been doing that before using Dial Plan or, or AGI or whatever, but like, Asterisk was still kind of doing things in the background for you. This, this is really like you are in control, and if you don't write a good application, then then it's your fault that things have failed. Um, and then I guess my last point is, it used to be that you would you would download Asterisk 1.4 and, and you'd stay on Asterisk 1.4 for many, 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 many years. Um, and then because there were no new features or, or, or upgrading was difficult and because our whole, whole phone system was built on 1.4, you, you didn't want to upgrade. Now that we've got ARI and all of your applications are actually external to Asterisk, Asterisk is just a media engine, and you're just upgrading the media engine part, which means I've, I've heard a lot, a lot of people say this week that they, that they don't really want to upgrade to 14 because it's not an LTS, um, but they're using ARI. Um, and 14 comes with, with Opus, um, which is great for if you're using WebRTC, et cetera, but it also comes with brand new ARI features, things that we were kind of wrapping in our, we, like every single ARI developer wrote a wrapper that played one prompt, then listened for it to finish, then played another prompt, listened for that to finish, and then played another prompt. Every single ARI developer did this, and it's now in ARI for, in 14, um, along with a couple, a couple of other things like playing HTTP media. Um, and my answer to all of them have been, well, yeah, 14 isn't an LTS, but the reasons why we used to stick to an LTS for a very, very long time, that especially if you're just writing ARI applications, is, is kind of dead now, um, at least in my opinion. I don't know how everyone else feels about that. Well, you know, I, I think we've usually been willing to stay more on the edge just because... Um, that's how the web works. That's how the web works, right? I mean, that, that constant upgrade cycle is more comfortable to us. I, I won't deny that there are use cases, especially in more traditional telephony, where you do kind of want to set it up and leave it for a long time and not change it. Um, but that, maybe that's another difference between web and telephony, like that, the sort of expectation of, of the platform. I think that's a good point to bring up is that you know, those are the old installations that do keep that old version of Asterix running. And those are the guys who might be able to benefit the most from getting the newer uh, mentality of being able to get that information outside of that system to process for, you know, if they need to, maybe they discover something about their business they never knew because they haven't touched it in years. They assume it's just you know, handling your PBX. Maybe there's a lot of information there that they don't even know that they have. Um, and so I would encourage those people who have old systems to look at the newer ones, get into that mentality of, no, I'm going to upgrade more often, I'm going to see what the, what's going on here, externalize some of these features, and get them off into the web so you can make more informed choices about your entire technology stack rather than just setting it and forgetting it. When you mentioned the, the, how slow the carriers are moving, I mean, the world is moving much more quickly. And the carriers are the best example of something that hasn't figured that out. I mean, they take forever to do, to do little things. I think that... Um, if, if anything, the web mentality of release constantly and continue to upgrade is, you know, it enables a, a lot of features. And the nice thing is, with WebRTC, not that I say we should expect it to fail, we shouldn't, but I think that the user tolerance for things that don't go quite perfectly is much more reasonable than on a cell phone where, you know, you drop a call and it's, it's a big deal. It's actually, it's actually one of the best parts about cell is you drop a call and people are so used to it. Okay, they're, sure, like, yeah. they're like, they're like, oh, oh, my call drop. Just Maybe redial. landline's a better example. They've actually, they've actually, yeah, they've actually like built their whole idea around. Oh, this is probably not as stable now. If you haven't have dropped landline, you know, everyone's world explodes. All right. So hooking asterisk up to the web. What are some of the security implications, and how are those handled usually? Well, I think the you know the it's funny because the biggest security risk with asterisk today seems to be toll fraud. It's really hard to get burned with toll fraud if you don't have toll. <laughs> um, you know, telephony had, was so focused on minutes and charging by the minute, and you know, the fact that calling Nigeria was more expensive than, than calling New York. So just by removing that whole profit incentive, a tremendous risk factor is, is eliminated. 
That's not to say there aren't risks. There are, clearly. I mean, the, the web is still a, a scary place, and you still have to do things to, to protect against it. Um, I, I think the issues now become more like privacy and, and um, you know, identity and those kind of things. But I, I think that from at least a purely monetary perspective, the, the single biggest risk is eliminated just by changing the model we use. Yeah, I do worry a little bit about, there wasn't, we didn't ever see this in the wild, but you know, some sort of thing like a malformed zip pack or something like that that can come in and can take down the entire server, right? It's not a very common thing, but that's the kind of stuff that I worry about as, the, as uh, these become more widely deployed and people start to try to find weaknesses in them and vulnerabilities, that they'll find sort of an unexposed one like that that can actually just take down a bunch of exposed servers. So part of it too is also having a, like, a, like a basically a high availability fault tolerant system where if a couple of them go down, it's not gonna be the end of the world. You can figure out what's going on, turn on new ones, and like Ben is saying, if tolling is not a problem, then there's no real monetary loss there. It's just a service outage, and you can identify it and correct it and maybe block the traffic from wherever it's coming. But it's a lot more about sort of just mitigating standard web-style risks of things uh, and less about where you're going to lose money if that's something you've already controlled. Yeah. Matt, do you want to? Yeah. Sure. I mean, I can't. I think that you're exactly right. Uh, you know, I, I actually, I, when I was thinking about the question, I didn't even consider that side of it, but you know, as we go to a more toolless world where there's less dependence on interconnect with, with, uh, with entities that require payment and things like that, service providers, for better or worse, um, it, it really does take a lot of the, the monetary risk out of it. You know, the other side is, is service related, um, but from Astro's perspective, you know, as the project has matured, and I think this is probably happening across the board in a lot of open source projects, but um, you know, th there's a very strong emph emphasis of bringing um, what I think probably started in, in, well, it depends on who you ask, but you know, there's, there, it's very popular right now to completely test, to do unit testing and functional testing and things like that. In the last few years in Astros land, there's been a lot of effort devoted to enhancing the automated test or the automated test suite for Astros. There's a, an automated test suite, for those of you who aren't aware, that runs on changes that are contributed to Asterisk. And if a change is included that breaks one of the tests, then, then the change is backed out and we figure out why it broke it and decide whether or not it's important enough to go in. But um, in terms of producing code, uh, producing a system and code that that provides a, a highly stable experience in the, in the face of things like fuzzing attacks, zip fuzzing attacks. Just two weeks ago, we, uh, we had some of the Astros development team go to a conference called SIPIT, which is an interop conference that occurs, I think, annually um, up in New Hampshire. And one of the, the teams there, and they have a, a fuzzing tool. And I guess historically, there have been, uh, it has historically wreaked havoc on a lot of different SIP stacks. And one of the cool things about our newer SIP stack, which is ChampiJ SIP, um, just a quick question. How many of you are using ChampiJ SIP right now? How many of you are using Chan SIP? OK. So um, just as a public service announcement, um, Chan SIP, so uh, you know, I don't know what your, your business needs are and your business, the things that you depend on from a business perspective. But in terms of moving things forward, Cham PJ SIP is the future. Um, and you know, there were a lot of reasons for, for doing it, but uh, you know, Chan SIP is essentially a, approximately about a 15 year old SIP stack that was built and grown organically and has gotten had gotten to the point where it was extremely difficult to, to develop and to change. And so uh, the Astros development team a few years ago took a took a step back and decided that there was some really good open source libraries and things available that we could kind of rebuild our SIP stack on. And they did that, and that's with the, it's called PJ Project. But uh, in terms of, so historically at, at SIP, it's back to what I was saying, uh, I guess Chan SIP has, has hard, had a hard time in, in space of big fuzzing attacks and things like that. So fuzzing is where you know, you'll, you'll introduce some entropy into SIP messaging and things like that or different parts of the protocols involved and see if you can, due to some of that random entropy, see if you can find holes or ways to crash the system or, or compromise it or cause, cause difficulty. And in the past, that's been a point of grief for Chan SIP. Um, well, in terms of this last week with Chan PJ SIP, so uh, I guess essentially, uh, 
what I'm trying to say is, in the past, I guess within you know an hour or two, they're inevitably they'd find something. And this last round of testing or whatever, two weeks ago, they had ChampiJ sip in the mix, and it went the whole week and couldn't crash it. So in terms of better technology stacks, building things in better ways, and then building tests around it, Asterisk is moving forward in a direction that keeps, um, I guess, a web-based attack policy from, it keeps it on the forefront of trying to stay ahead of, of those in, in terms of best, best practices and resiliency. So, um, you know, I, I look forward optimistically to, to some of the newer technologies that we've been adding in Asterisk. So this is my last question. Can, can I, before that, yes. I, can I just say, so there we talked an awful lot about like typical telephony security. Um, ARI is web connected, and so that, that is another entry point. Um, and if, when you write an ARI application using Node or Go or whatever, like you, you would never hook ARI up directly from the browser. Like the, you, you don't, you don't want to connect from a browser straight into Asterisk and so start sending HTTP requests that way. Like you would never do that. And it, it's the same, like Asterisk, you, you open up Asterisk to your service. And your service doesn't necessarily just like proxy messages straight into an asterisk. Your service has been told, oh, I want to make a phone call. And that, other than like a phone number or whatever, then that, the phone number gets moved forward, nothing else. So like in terms of security, in terms of asterisk and ARI, as long as you write your apps in a nice way that you would expect developers to write services today, um, then, then ARI isn't another kind of entry point. So, as we all know, asterisk can be used for naughty things as well. I don't know how many of you in the audience have received phone calls from Vincent, uh, Victoria, Rachel. What, is, what do you feel when you get these phone calls? If something you've created or worked on and it's being used to try to steal credit cards from people that are dumb enough to give their Can credit I card number say, I, I never receive such phone calls <laughs> because the, the UK has a much better kind of policy on I wish we did too. So I, I chuckle because I, I think about this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 um, it's a little bit ironic that, you know, a lot of the, the travails that we deal with in terms of getting, you know, random phone calls throughout the day, not just, not just fraud, fraud but just you know a lot of telemarketing is built on not just asterisk but built on the the rise of open source telephony and the fact that you don't have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a call center just for the technology portion or millions of dollars just for the technology portions for a call center anymore you just need to provide you just need to basically have somebody that can sell you uh, sell you service and uh, you just need an asterisk box or free switch box or, or a SIP proxy and and you can build it yourself, and so, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's it, it has its ups and downs. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not really, it's not really our fault. Like, no, it's it, not. So, so, do, it, not that like I get these phone calls, but <clears throat> do, does it bother me that something that I contribute to, whether or not it's code or, or within the community, is being used in a way that is bad? No. Because that, that's why we have law enforcement. That's why we have um, governments that make policies to help to stop these things happening. Um, you, you can't say, well, this technology was used in a bad way. We should never like, develop this any further. Um, no, that's not going to happen. The problem in the US is the policy is just not, they're not enforcing it. Yeah, I mean, I think the tools that they do have, the carriers don't have enough incentive. There's no, not really any liability for them, right? They, they, if they pass the traffic, they get the minutes, they get the bill for it. So yeah. there's, there's no legal repercussion for them. So they're not really incented to solve the problem. Yeah, you can see that in the new FCC stuff, some of the anti-robocalling features. I mean, we just launched our own anti-robocalling thing. It took us five days from its inception to completing it. it uses the FCC and, you know, block list and everything else. You could do this in a heartbeat on the carrier level if they wanted to. Uh, they do not, right. you know, and whereas we as the small MVNO, you know, we're paying them for the interconnection, so we want to control us as tightly as we can. We have lots of anti-fraud stuff, lots of that, but we've had to build it all because none of it exists lower down. Again, this is a problem with just the, if you have a toll-based system, uh, like you do, and the policy is just not enforced. Correct. Anybody have questions in the audience?
Um, going forward with uh, so okay. going forward with with in regards to security, where do you see like perhaps AI coming in and being sort of digital centuries to help protect? Because if we wait for policy from the government, you know, there's going to be lost a uh, lot of lost revenue. But I didn't know if anybody's considered possibly development of AI and bringing bringing it in just to help uh, with the security. I've, I've certainly seen things like that. I mean, the, so the whole thing about AI is it really works well when you have uh, a large volume of something, right, where you can look for patterns, because AI's whole thing is looking for patterns and, and matching and reacting. Um, so the biggest sort of uh, application is probably toll fraud, right, because you're looking for a sudden spike in phone calls to some place in Africa that you've not had a phone call there in five years, right? Why am I suddenly burning 70 channels going to, going to that location? Um, so I think, I think there are applications. I, I can't recall any companies that do this, but I've seen people make these kind of um, apps before. From a non-telephony perspective, I had a friend who worked at a company. They were trying to come up with something they called the ballistics of the network, you know, looking for um, connections coming in at a new rate that, that weren't expected or you know, um, hitting web services that, that weren't getting traffic. It, it is a hard problem. I think, I think it, its applicability primarily to um, something that's repeatable means it's sort of narrow. You can really only solve a problem in, in certain applications. Um, and I also think that it's, it's a hard one, especially with the tools that we have today. AI and machine learning is getting better, but it's, it's not a magic button. You can't just say, well, I'm going to throw some AI at it and it's going to solve my problems. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more of a narrow, focused kind of tool. All right, thank you guys. It's lunchtime. <laughs> thank you all.